Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Vikram Singh, presently the Chancellor of Noida International University, he is one of the most respected police generals of this country. I mean, when I talk about him, it's going to be something which is going to be very important for us. My technology is again showing some glitch. When I am going to introduce him, you will see that his power of what he has done in the world has been phenomenal. Former officer of Indian Police Services 1974 batch, former Director General of Police Uttar Pradesh, the police, the largest police force in the world, consisting of 190,000 in Hindi, I will say, ek lakh nabbe hazar personnel. In the international world, 190,000 police force. No one in the world must have heard about it. And one of the most highly decorated police officers in the country, who has relentlessly fought against national and international terrorism, that two outfits like Al-Qaeda, Harkatullah Ansar, Jaishe Mohammed, ISI, left wing extremism, and organized many crime syndicates. He has directly worked for the modernization and induction of state of art technology and universal best practices to make police force effective and people friendly. Rated as star trainer and speaker on issues related to security, man management, crisis resolution team, building values and ethics. I remember, I repeat about this, values and ethics. Dr. Vikram Singh completed his MSc from Allahabad University in 1972 and PhD ecology from Kumau University in 1990. When I look at his career span since 1976, which I was researching, in 76, he was assistant superintendent of police, Mirzapur, moved to ADC to governor of Uttar Pradesh, then to Ita, Nanital, Agra, and Kanpur as senior superintendent of police. And finally, in October 91, he became the deputy inspector general then in 97, he was given the responsibility of Inspector General Task Force, which was to establish and start and efficiently run the elite force of the police. He established this in four states. Wow, amazing. He then had a stint of being Inspector General Law and Order, Crime, Special Task Force, Additional Director General Interstate Border Force, followed by Additional Director General, Central Industrial Security Force. June 2007, he was welcomed as top most position of top most 190,000 police force. Never, never, ever heard in the world such a large force. Ladies and gentlemen who are watching or will be watching it globally, this is 190,000. UP is probably 20 times Australia. And he became the director general of such a large force of police personnel. And then director general of home guards. When I was researching his background and profile, it was an amazing experience, I tell you, sir. Amazing experience to see someone unparalleled, unique, who has been part of every part of police force and known as one of the most toughest police chief, but with a lot of humility and compassion at the same time. So connectivity of being tough, as well as having humility and compassion, talks about his leadership style. Director General Police, Dr. Vikram Singh, has been known for doing something which others never, ever dared to do. A daring police chief made waves at every assignment as general of guts, happenings, and above all, he has been 
the top of the core professionalism and aura of simply elegant human being making a difference. Finally, today he is holding the position of at the education excellence in the country as the chancellor of one of the reputed University of India called Noida International University. I mean, now let me share this beautiful story of awards and accolades he received. President Police Medal for Gallantry 1986, Bar to President Police Medal of Gallantry 1987, 88, 89, all the three years. President's Police Medal for Long and Meritorious Services 1990, President Police Medal for Distinguished Services in 1996, Katin Seva Medal 2001, Bar to Katin Seva Medal again in 2002. Also, Limka Book of Records 2014 mentions him the most highly decorated police officer in India. Wow, what a brilliant person, what a brilliant personality, fascinating. And when I look at his, uh, you know, uh, background while researching, I found that his publication as book entitled Ecosystem of Central Himalayas, book entitled as Human Rights and Police, National Award presented by National Human Rights Commission, New Delhi, Chambal Decoits Bagis or Bandits, Mewar University Press available on Flipkart. This is huge list of various national and international conferences where he has been invited as keynote speaker many times. More than 120 speaking assignments on topics from police, home guards, crime management, leadership, and education excellence, and the next gen excellence. Must, must go through his details, I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, of such a great police chief of the country. Proud feeling to see him today with me. My hand folded pranams in front of him and also put him as the lead I am to have him here. And I must tell you, and I must tell you that I came in contact with him through my mentor, Dr. Kiran Bedi. Madam Bedi, we are remembering you here. <laughs> she connected me to uh, Dr. Singh when I was making a proposal to UNDP for doing a lot of programs on the police force. And because of COVID, everything is stopped. The great police chief, now the education excellence leader in him, he is spreading education. He is building the future generation of our country. He is building the future. He is securing our Bharat Varsha. He is securing our, uh, you know, Vande Mataram. You can see him participating regularly on leading television channels, debates like Republic TV, Time TV. Nivex, CND, Ajdak, News 18, News 24, Lok Sabha TV, Raj Sabha TV, Z News, Hindustan, CNBC, TV India News, Z Business, News Nation, News World India. This one man is a package of knowledge, wisdom, guts, leadership, and management in both police and education. You must watch his YouTube links to add value to your life. I did watch some of his YouTubes. I also would like to tell you, I always watch him when he is on a deliberation on a very important topic on the television. I don't know how to stop myself. I don't know how to talk about such a great man. And I don't know how to uh, say that I need to move forward with folded hands. And indeed, pleasure, Seth, to have you here, Seth. 
my pleasure sir thank you so much for the very kind introduction you are so very kind but there's a shakespearean saying the beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder and you see choose to see virtue where there is done i'm overwhelmed because you, i'm sharing a platform already graced by very iconic people and i'm not even worthy of being the dust of their feet and today you have allowed me to share this vibrant platform which is in the service of the nation and all those entrepreneurs and those seeking knowledge from you thank you very much dr singh your journey of leadership excellence has been just awesome in the western world we talk about awesome you know my kids talk about everything they say awesome and i am talking about awesome means it has been one of the beautiful journey of excellence but when i go through your huge background and profile i do find that you must have gone through a lot of issues challenges and that too when you were a child as a student how did you get into this was it a planned action was it your missioning was there someone who guided you as a mentor your father your mother or any other mentors how did you as a student as a child i am looking at dr vikram singh that child 60 years back 62 years back and today becoming such a powerful person over to you sir god bless you mr bakshi thank you for the very kind question it takes me back to my childhood yes we are from average upper middle class family father a senior bureaucrat but an absolutely upright a man of tremendous honor mother into religion religious practices humanity and there were two strains of inheritance from my mother truth simplicity and love from the father punctuality hard work and thrift and a no nonsense approach to academics there was all the love all the affection but no compromise as far as basic decency was concerned the house we always had a library it was free for all of us but every magazine that came to us and every film that we were supposed allowed to see were first censored by my parents whether it was worthy for us brothers and sisters to see those films or those magazines so the two or three magazines that were allowed in the home one was the readers digest the other was women and home the third was kalyan and the fourth was navneet a hindi magazine akin to the readers digest no other publication was allowed only the best sellers from the world were allowed in our library when i became 16 my mother said ki because the communication with the father was very rare but the mother said now that you are 16 you are a big boy and i had had no cause of complaint but amongst the seven brothers and sisters you are the youngest it's my duty to tell you i love you very much but this house belongs to decent people the day you are in a brawl or caught teasing or having running after girls that will be the last day you'd be coming into the house i'll presume that i did not have a son please don't come back home your father is not will not going to bail you out if in case you are in trouble with the police and there's a three line advertisement vikram singh son of markande singh has fallen into bad company he will have no share in the family estates and the legacy we disown him totally now any cause of any doubts in your mind can no ma no doubts okay go and study now this is the time to study 5 to 8 compulsory studies 8 to 8:30 was dinner time and early in the morning the quilts whatever be the temperature was confiscated the boys would work out rain hail or storm and unless i was puking or absolutely bedridden it was compulsory sir and the, to come out that the boy should be men of steel and the sisters were absolute epitome of dignity honor and grace and charm we are supposed to be absolute gentlemen committed to the cause of the nation and the lesser privileged society and to be upright and moral to the core sir whether we did well or we did not do well was secondary but we we'll say that i would like you to be a man of steel and absolutely upright human being the books that we were given to us because the books that we read my father said were extend will be extensions to your personality so the books that he gave me was shakespeare milton and on the other hand in the hindi sumitra nandan pant uh, mahadevi varma the ramcharit manas in urdu also we were made to read the holy quran we were also made to read 
the Bhagavad Gita, the Holy Bible. I still know much of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, right up to, uh, you can say, uh, the Holy Quran, the, the Gulista and Bosta in Persian. I could, but it will be a waste of time. But yes, it was a composite culture of teaching you the best that every civilization had to offer. Amazing. And first of all, <clears throat> my great respect to your mom and dad. Thank you. And we must be watching your mom and dad is, uh, they are here. Where are you, mom and dad? I haven't seen God, but they are my gods. They are with God just now. I lost them. I didn't say I would lose them, but yes, they went to the heavenly abode about three decades ago. First of all, my respect to them, and they must be watching you from that part of the world, looking at you, that our son, what we desire, and he has become a man of steel. And when, I, when you talk about your mom saying truth, simplicity and love and your father saying punctuality hard work no nonsense no compromise wow these are the biggest mentors of life you had so my respects to them and in fact in our lives our parents our father our mother are the supreme mentors of life I lost my mom only last year mm. and so sorry to she had the biggest women power of my life. And that's where I do women power program. And I lost Wonderful. my father when I was only 12 year old and my mom was only 41 year old. Oh. She saw struggle and she is the biggest women power and I respect her. My so celebrations I, to your parents. When I look at your parents and when you talked about your childhood journey, I think you gave us what kind of person was being groomed, developed, nurtured. And that is where we have Dr. Vikram Singh today in our life. Thank you. Salutes to them. Thank Dr. Singh, when I was going through your background and I was looking at your service of nation, I am able to see some of the most tough assignments you have handled. That too in Uttar Pradesh, and that too at a time when you were there. Now, there's a lot of changes. Could you please share with us some of the challenging assignments which made you known for what you are today? And I'm especially talking about the tenure when you handled the Chambal decoys, also when you handled international terrorist outbreaks like Al Qaeda, Harkatil. Ula Ansar, Jaisha Mohammed, and others. Kindly give us your this beautiful journey of daring and tough Polish sheep with a lot of guts and unknown and unprecedented and making things to happen. It's not easy. We would, me and my audience would love to know this story of your excellence as one of the daring police officers with respect to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bakshi. I would certainly like to recount with the greatest of modesty and humility. I would only say that these accolades came because God has been very kind to me. My late parents' blessings were always be. There's one medal. I've got all the medals twice over. There's one medal that I could not get, and that is gallantry medal posthumously. Well, that was the will of God that I should not get gallantry medal posthumously. But if there ever was a chance, I have been shot at thrice. But it is the mercy of the Almighty that I did not go to the world, to the happier world. But it has been a different. There are two kinds of generals. One is a living room general in the niceties and the etiquette and of course the socializing. And the other is a battlefield general who only smells of gunpowder. My entire career has been from one crisis to the other crisis, airlifted from one area to the other area where the disturbances are such. I never had a normal transfer, which I can recall, always airlifted to cater to an emergency. The first emergency came in 1981 in Nathwapur in Eta, when the entire police station was wiped out by Chabiram gang. The inspector Rajpal Singh, two sub-inspectors, head constables, 10 constables and the home guard, the entire police station was wiped out. The demoralization was such that I was airlifted from Hamirpur to Eta and people said, please remove your name plate, please remove the star plate of your car because the decoys might ambush you. If that be the price to 
pay to live i would rather die than to survive like a coward so let we know that i am not scared of anything or anyone we will rough it out we will take them on heads on there were army deserters in chaviram gang they used to move with survey of india maps with compasses and move in extended orders like like professional commandos we in any case do not match up to the phys- the training and the prowess of the armed forces but we are fast learners also we picked up our field craft and tactics and in two years the entire gang and all the gangsters operating there were accounted for and neutralized but that was a heavy price in terms of the police casualties that we had to pay and the anti decoity operations it was matter of tremendous satisfaction that the government ba- backed me and the then recommendations that i made banditry now is almost under control and there's hardly any decoyed gang any longer then we come to the next biggest thing about al qaeda few people would know till about 10 years ago people said in a conference we never had al qaeda in india the fact of the matter is when i was dig merit in saharanpur you may recall two british hostages and one american hostage were kidnapped from pahalganj taken to saharanpur and after a fierce encounter when we lost inspector dhruvlal yadav of sahibabad ghaziabad two other constables we managed to save and we captured guess who sayyad mohammad umar sheikh number 2 of al qaeda second only to osama bin laden he was in our prisons and we interrogated him for 60 days he was and a very tough nut to crack but then as history would have it there was the hijacking of the indian airlines plane he along with azhar masood and a third terrorist was released in kandahar but it was my my duty to arrest him interrogate him and see what is behind the eyeballs of a terrorist what made him a terrorist after graduation from london school of economics after doing so well in life coming from rich parents educated parents what made him do what he did you may recall that before 911 he was the one who sent half a million dollars to mohammed atta in the usa and i would not go into the greater details but the fact of the matter is that al qaeda was there and no other than sir john major the then prime minister of england wrote a personal letter to me that her majesty's government, government communicates their sincere good wishes to me and if there was anything that i could do for the my fallen comrades her majesty's government would be honored to do that so that is the kind of honor that comes your way when you are straight forward and not bothered about consequences then accolades come your way unasked then there is the case of organized gang of criminals there are those people sitting in dubai singapore bangkok and operating through a remote control getting extortion contract killing manipulating elections how do you handle them well there are ways and means the technology gives us the power to get the foot soldiers first in mumbai and madras chennai hyderabad the foot soldiers on a thorough interrogation would take you to the sergeant the sergeant will take you to the lieutenant and the lieutenant will take you to the captain with an emperor without clothes and a general without foot soldiers yet the gang is nothing but totally decimated then there was a case you may heard that daud ibrahim's properties were not and could not be put out for sale because there were no buyers when i faced this problem of what to do with the properties of the gangsters if there are no buyers because of fear okay we will open police stations and hospitals in them but these properties will not go back to the gangsters or to their families these will remain public properties and for the use of the public of this province and of the state not a single property went by default and all the properties the stf headquarters sir are housed in rent free accommodation of the late gangster uh, sudh prakash shukla on whom a film has been made also sir and all the two properties i mean you must see what kind of grandeur that man had all plush marble and teak but they are now the offices of the special task force and i am the supervisor of those properties so if there is anyone to blame who did what i am the person to blame because i am the supervisor at zero rent these two buildings are available to the police force of uttar pradesh but the message is very loud and clear mr bakshi that you transgress the rule of law and then you will be finished sitting in bangkok and dubai will not help you. i was listening to the entire journey of excellence and daring situation of what all you have done i mean i, I don't know what to say but i can say that uh, probably god has always been with you 
you with a sense of humility, with a sense of humility, being such a powerful person. And at the same time, the way you are humble, the way you have been passionate about it, one dharma, that is your country. And who would not know more about Al-Qaeda's and uh, the hijack of the plane? I am a Kashmiri Pandit and you know we are victims. Who would know that? Absolutely. I don't want to go to that at this point of time. But your journey has been remarkable. And the entire country will feel proud of such a personality. I have no words. I have no words to... Uh, see, when I will re-watch it again, uh, when I will watch this program again, I will actually get more and more, more and more knowledge about your personality. Dr. Singh, moving forward, you seem to be someone in the police force who has handled all kinds of assignments, be it police, be it home guards, be it crime, be it special task force be it terrorism, national, international, be it interstate border forces, be it central industrial security forces. So there is nothing left in the entire uh, police domain which you have not handled. Can you share with us what were those significant issues and challenges in addition to what you shared And how did you become the most admired police chief whenever you got opportunity to create and ambush those challenges, those difficulties and making yourself a brand, making yourself a proud police officer of our nation? Thank you so much that you've raised this topic because this is sounds very passionate about the problems the police are facing today as they were facing many decades earlier. In any police setup, there are three or four common things. First is a sense of helplessness, demoralization, and a sinking feeling at all ranks. If you were to say it's only the non gazetted no, it is at the senior most level, a feeling of overwork, helplessness, and an inferiority complex. The tremendous amount of overwork, unrealistic expectations from a force in whose DNA it is not to say no. What do I say? I want you to jump from the 10th floor. Yes, sir. I mean, there is no way because I'm trained for generations to say yes, sir. I will never say no, sir. If you say that, okay, uh, a policeman can never go on strike because he only has to say yes, sir. If I say that you have, will not, the ASP, my BSB, my mentor said the ASP, a newly married ASP, he will be on patrol duty every day from, after working from the police line, the police officer 12 at night, he'll be on patrol duty on horseback from 12 in night to 4 a.m. in the morning, seven days a week. I say, yes, sir. So these are the things that were the part of the work culture, helplessness, inferiority complex, a sinking feeling, lack of technology, no improvement in the weaponry, the field craft, the tactics, and the legal system. So what do you do? Either you be a part of it and swim as a like dead fish, swim with the stream, or you put your best foot forward and tell the policymakers there needs to be a drastic change as far as arms and ammunition are concerned. Then the legal framework is concerned. Then we need to have what is known as compulsory leave at least one. No, don't, don't give us two weekends. At least give us two weekends. At least give us, don't give us 30 days. Give us 10 days of earned leave so that you can catch on on the sleep information overload, work overload, and be with the family, which is a shock absorber. The statistics of self-harm and attempted suicide and the suicide that did happen, please, are absolutely scary and would put off any senior police manager. Therefore, I would say in any police outfit, the first thing is social sensitivity. The second is the guts to tell the political masters that thus far and no further, we need to have a budget to improve our weaponry, our training, our capacity building as also please change the laws. These laws date back to 1860 and now we are living in the year 2000. There is no definition of what a gangster is. How do you attach the property? How do you see that the person is put behind bars? How do you say that a confession made before a police officer because the earlier laws were confession made to a police officer is inadmissible before 
a court of law, even it is before a DGP, but a confession made before a chaprasi or a PN is admissible in a court of law. But a confession made before a director of police is not admissible in a court of law. These anomalies will have to be set right. Do set them right and you see the result yourself. STF, Mr. Bakshi, has accounted for the most notorious gangsters in the country and the world, but not a single case of human rights violation against the STF because they're totally professional, at par with the best in the world. They do not have to touch anyone. And anyone who comes in our custody, wherever the Harkat ul Saad, Hizbul Mujahideen, and all the terrorists, they go to jail and they said, yes, we were treated very well. We were allowed to offer our prayers. We were not subjected to third degree any brutality because technology gives us whatever is there behind their eyeballs and what was there in their intestines. We can get it out without touching the person, sir. Marvelous. I, I don't know what to say, but I am feeling so excited. I am feeling so alienated looking at you and sharing your story. But tell me as a police officer, when you started your career, finally one day, a day came, then you became the top most police officer, police general rather, director general of police of UP. 20 times Australia, 190,000 people around you. And you delivered that accountability and responsibility with power of passion, persistence and perseverance. People still remember the best tenure under your leadership. Even people talk today. And you know that I also know one of another uh, Director General of Police of UP, Dr. Girish Bihari. I had great respect for him and I supported him in supporting uh, the uh, business school way back in the uh, 90s. And your name is always seen with that respect. Now, when you from a police officer, as an assistant superintendent of police, attain that position, what was going on in your mind that I am the boss of 190,000 police officers, largest police officer brand in the world, nowhere heard, unheard, unknown, unbelievable. What made you to be that position and how did you deliver differently? Because when you were sharing your thoughts, changing the law, having a lot of guts to tell the political bosses, I cannot jump from the 10th floor. I cannot do this. And you know, I will not go to that right now. I'll go to that part later, what's going on with various police chiefs. True, true. How did you do that? And how was your own persona, personality, pride, ego coming in? What was that? Ego cannot come to your personality. But then when you attained such a position, how was that in your DNA, in your stride? Because then audience should be able to pick up those leadership traits in any field of activity, whether we are in business or politics or military or hotel or manufacturing, leadership is leadership. Yes, sir. Absolutely, Mr. Bakshi. And this is one thing that I'd like to share and it will be like my dying declaration. Because I will not, I've never spoken an untruth, and this will be the truth that I have lived. I became the DGP because of my junior colleagues. Had they not been there, I wouldn't have been the Director General Police. I bless my junior colleagues, each and every one of the 200,000 who made me the DGP. And made me the first servant of my state. If UP had been a country, it would have been the fifth largest country in the world. So the first thing that Dr. Girish Bihari taught me you may or may not be in a position to take all the calls, but from 12 at night to 6 in the morning, all the calls will be taken by you and your junior colleagues because that is the time when people are in an emergency, an acute emergency, and they would require your assistance. Therefore, it may come at a cost, a small personal adjustment, take all the calls. Never refuse to see a person ever by 24 by 7 unless that person is of ill repute, a blackmailer or a smuggler or a crook. Otherwise, please, your door should be open. They, say, they have a saying, meeting time between 11 and 1. No, nothing. Meeting time 24 by 7. Anyone in distress is most welcome anytime. 
And the third thing that I do, as in cricket, they say, Mr. Bakshi, when you become the DGP or you become the head of a corporate world, it is like 288 not out. It does not really matter whether you are out on the first ball or you make another century. But that to leave a mark that it will be difficult for people to efface or forget. That is the time to bring about the change that he always thought that if God Almighty gives you the day and the time, be that change and bring that change. 50 officers would read and scan every newspaper in all the languages, watch every TV channels. If there is a misdemeanor or a crime, I would speak to at least 25 SOs and SPs every day. In the next 24 hours, this case has to be worked out. The criminals put behind bars and those criminals who, if you were to put behind bars, there'll be Diwali in the area. I would want them behind the bars. Now you have an option to put them behind bars and get my letter of appreciation. If you don't, well, the hawalat where your inspector is there, that hawalat will, that inspector will go into that lockup and the media will bear to take the photograph that he was the inspector till yesterday since he was complicit with the accused. He was put behind bars by the DGP. Don't blame anyone. I know you have a soft corner. I know you are not tough enough to say and call a spade a shovel. I have no such compulsions. That inspector will go to jail. That termination will happen. People who are mixed up with criminals will have to go. That is a small price that we all have to pay. And then to serve the people, to be the first servant of the people who I am honored to serve, I will be one of their unworthy servants and the first servants. This DG ship will not last very long. Unfortunately or fortunately, it is the longest tenure that I, any DG had in the last 65 years. I did not that. I always remained in my own home, the modest middle MIG home in Indra Nagar. But I had the longest innings at the DGP because I was not bothered about the consequences. And my advice to all the leaders would be, feel free that what is right has to have your backing. And you must only subscribe to the path of righteousness and only that politicians may come and politicians may go, but you and your conscience will go on forever. Amazing. Ladies and gentlemen around the world who are watching it now and who are going to be watching it later, see the journey of excellence as a police chief with tough, difficult, tough task master, but with humility and with compassion. Amazing, sir. Sir, when you talk about be the change and bring the change, be the change and bring the change. And you talked about Dr. Girish Bihari, and uh, he was again a fatherly figure for me, and he always treated me as my son. He must be watching us from that part of the world and looking at DJ Bakshi and Dr. Vikram Singh together on a show. Fascinating. And uh, I have a question now. Looking at your police, all your beautiful, excellent journey, with blood, sweat, and tears all the time, because you have gone through very tough challenges. It has not been an ordinary journey. It has been rough and tough. It has been difficult. One bullet anywhere would have made a different situation. That's what you're talking about. Now, when you move to the next level of excellence, I am keen to know about your different experience as an education excellence leader, as Chancellor of Noida International University. Is there a difference between the two kinds of leadership? One side, we have a military or a police leadership, and other side, you are a now education excellence leader. Now, those two leadership, I will call DNA of leadership, is there a difference? Because I see one person holding these two. What is the difference? How can we create a similar kind of DNA into all kinds of leadership. Mr. Bakshi, there are common denominators and there are, you'll be surprised to know that I have found that what works in the armed forces works in the education, which will also work in the corporate because these things will never be old fashioned. They will never be out of date and they will be relevant in all times to come. As they say in Sanskrit, Desh Kal Ravasta, these are eternal truths that will be relevant both in the armed forces and in education. First is integrity. Integrity in respect of knowledge seeking, learning, especially in higher education. Integrity in respect of how I deal with my colleagues, my students, my fellow. We have students from 27 countries. 
and it, I take pains to ensure that they all belong to me and I belong to them. On a show in NDTV, this, there was a girl from Nigeria and the anchor tried her level best to say, have you been discriminated against? Have you been uh, subjected to any kind of humiliation? That girl, I must say, one of the biggest medal for me was also this. That girl with tears has said, you see the man sitting next to you. He's not only the chancellor, he's like my father. I have not missed home. That man sitting by side, hinting, pointing at me, that man is my chancellor. And I have never felt humiliated. I have never been singled out. I have never been discriminated against because my father stands like the rock of Gibraltar if there's any case or any allegation against any one of us. We have never felt discriminated. A Kashmiri girl, a Muslim girl in a burqa comes, Abba, I'm going. She said, did not say, sir. She said, Abba, I'm going. She wanted to touch my feet. That no beta is against your faith to touch anybody's feet. You have my blessings. I bless you. These are the rewards that come when you have an open heart for everyone, all inclusive. Integrity in respect. Integrity in respect of the purity. Nasti vidya samam chakshuhu. Knowledge is supposed to be an insight and inner understanding. I'm sorry to say, but at higher learning, at the level of research and writing papers, there are cases of plagiarism. They were best avoided. There cannot be shortcuts. Anybody taking shortcut, the only shortcut that one takes, whether in the armed forces of the corporate world or the academic world, is a shortcut or a recipe to disaster. There is no shortcut. And the only common denominator is deep work. I go to students and I go to universities like AMU. I go to universities like uh, JNU, DU. I find students getting up in the library from 6 a.m. I go to the evening, the same students there eating a banana and a coffee. Stays. But such students are very rare. It is difficult to find a student devoting eight hours, 10 hours, working on weekends in the laboratory, in the library. And then again, the pain, sacrifice and effort is not only for the uniformed forces. It is meant for the academicians. I was lucky to have teachers like Professor Devendra Shantrath, Professor Devendra Nautiyal, Professor Parveen Fatima Kidwai. They were those who said there are two or three demand weekends that I have. We work 365 a days, one day off for Diwali, one for Holi, one if there is a wedding in the family. But 363 days, eight to eight, we work for our research. That is the level of application and that is the level of deep work that is expected of any quality academician. And not to be have any university in the top 100 is again a question that needs to be addressed and answered with so much of talent. Our scientists go abroad and get the Nobel Prizes there. And here we are really have tried very hard to take us in the back seat and do nothing about ourselves. We got three Nobel Prizes before independence. And what has happened now? We do have Nobel Prizes, but most of the Nobel Prizes have come of those who are abroad. That needs to be set right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. So that means the leadership traits, attributes, character, courage remains the same. Whether you are a political leader, you are a corporate leader, you are a business leader, you are an education access leader, and you are a military and a police leader. However, I would, that's my personal experience, I would say that there's one thing which is very important, which we see from the, uh, you know, army and the police leadership. That is sense of belongingness and discipline, which is always very high. It's my, uh, my experience. The discipline of a military officer and a police officer or a general is much higher than any other leader in the world. Because they are actually part of their routine. It's a way of life. It is part of their DNA. Now, when I look at you, Dr. Singh, I understand that you have been very closely associated with Swami Ramakrishna, with Swami Vivekananda philosophy, and the movement since childhood. So here comes a question, especially in today's world, on ethical leadership. You have been known for driving a passionate ethical leadership style as a police chief. While as we see every day, and recently we saw in Mumbai, 
where police leadership has been questioned strongly and continuously on a particular case. I don't want to go to that. What are your views on ethical leadership? In all kinds of leadership, be it police, be it civil servants, or even the corporate world, I'm sure you would be able to give us some thoughts which can make us to, you know, promote our uh, ethical leadership much stronger and build and craft uh, our leadership style with your experience of four decades. Great. The question itself has tremendous mm -hmm. insights and potential. A leadership that is not covered and has the foundation of ethics is no leadership at all. It's a facade. It's counterfeit and it can only it can only last because every even a counterfeit coin has a shelf life. But a leadership that is not ethical, that is not value driven is no leadership whatsoever. You will see shooting stars. They come and they go and nobody talks about them. And it is here that my father, my late father, when I was 16, when my mother spoke to me, he gave me two books, Raj Yoga by Swami Vivekananda and the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. I read them and I'll give you 25 paise every day. 25 paise was a lot of money. You could get a Coke and an ice cream cone for 25 paise in, in, in those days. So that was a lot of money. I would read and then uh, uh, tell my father this is what I read. But ultimately, that is now a part of my DNA that ultimately a person, I may win or lose, my country should never lose. I may win or lose my society and those lesser privileged should never lose. If I am able to sacrifice myself, even the supreme sacrifice, and I serve my motherland and the people who are underprivileged, it will be my proud privilege to do so without batting an eyelid. And again, the leadership, Napoleon said, in any organization, he was facing his jailer, Sir Hudson Loy, in any organization, in any force, there's a small microscopic minority of those who are prepared to carry out any disloyal or any dishonorable act, any illegal orders. And this percentage in Napoleon's time was barely 1%. Today, it would exceed much, much more for those who would bend head over heels to curry favors with the political masters to get what? The so-called, mm, what can I say? Prestigious, so-called prestigious posting, so-called glamorous posting to get something that is post-retirement benefits. What and for what? If at the end of the day, the biggest bribe givers committed suicide like Warren Hastings and Robert Clive, the wages of sin is death, Mr. Bakshi. And I have yet to come across a person who has been dishonest and unfair enjoying a peaceful old age and retirement. The past comes and haunts all those people who see apparitions and ultimately I have yet to come about. If Warren Hastings and Robert Clive could not be happy, lesser mortals who may have robbed a few crores here and there will also not be happy. Ultimately, the happiest people are those who have led an honest life, an upright life. And it is here that the difference comes. That there are those not only in Mumbai, don't single out Mumbai or Maharashtra alone, everywhere, like Nepal said, a small percentage of officers who are ever willing to carry out illegitimate instructions of their bosses, which should never be the case. As I said before, there can be many occasions. It is better to be an honorable ex-DGP than to be a dishonorable serving DGP. I have no choices to make, but I have handled very difficult politicians, as UP will say, has very difficult politicians also. I, with the greatest of respect, there, came, there were situations when I had to say there are others who would be more than willing to carry out these instructions, but it is my painful duty not only to say no, but I will see to it that this task is never carried out ever. I will ensure a foolproof documentation that these tasks will never be carried out. If there is an instruction that requires my, my life, it will not be 24 hours, it will be immediate. But if it requires an immoral act, an in, uh, dishonorable act, a dishonest act upon my dead body, Mr. Bakshi, this is not going to happen. <sighs> Dr. Singh, I don't know. I have no words to say. But your respectability and uh, your aura and your presence and your commitment to the cause and the mission is fascinating. We always, in fact, when uh, with Madam Karen Bedi, we do leadership programs, and she always says that uh, whom are we cheating? 
there's somebody watching us. It's not a satellite. It is not a camera. There's somebody watching us inside. So are we cheating ourselves? And in case we are cheating ourselves, we will need sleeping pills to sleep for the nights. And that is what is coming out from your absolutely a very wonderful discussion we had just now about being ex-police DGP. You, it is better to take a decision to say, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> ah, amazing. And when I look at this, uh, you know, uh, leadership traits, now I am turning towards another leadership trait, which is authentic leadership. And I am specifically talking about now COVID-19. The world has gone through one of the major tough, difficult situations of our lives. We still do not know. Before COVID, BC is gone. We are in DC during COVID. We don't know when we will go to AC after COVID. So BC, DC, and AC. And during COVID, DC, we have seen many leaders. And I am not only talking about business leaders. I am saying even political leaders around the world. And I would not like to name them. They really shivered. And when it suddenly came, because leadership is when there is a sudden change, and there is an issue, there is a challenge. Leadership is who drive it and who says, don't worry, I am there to take control of it and we are together. We could see in this authentic leadership, our own Prime Minister Modi coming out first to the nation, then to the neighborhood, then to the entire world and fighting and saying, people first, business later. And I say this authentic leadership has been one of a very significant relation, leadership in the world, so far as Prime Minister Modi is concerned. I don't know, somebody may say that you are a Bhakta Prime Minister Modi. Yes, because he has showcased certain things which have been very powerful. So why I gave you an example of Prime Minister Modi, because when I see other leaders in the world, I don't want to name them, they literally shivered. What is your opinion about, we can't make an opinion about Prime Minister Modi, the Honorable Prime Minister Modi, but what's your opinion about authentic leadership and how do you feel about uh, our PM taking it forward? Mr. Bakshi, to talk of authenticity and not to speak about Mr. Modi, our Prime Minister, would be a travesty of truth. It will be unfair. I would say if there is an icon, if there's a person who's a role model, if a person who has in, in short capacity building at all levels, who has made mini Modis in every district, every mohalla, every locality, it is our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji. And he has so many followers. He has become a cult. People, hero, worship him as if nobody else has been respected and put on a, such a highest pedestal as Narendra Modi. And there's no harm in respect him. Of course, he has competition. But the secret lies in the fact comparison should be between comparables. The spiritual depth of that man is responsible for his straight backbone and a no-nonsense approach to administration and to our illustrious neighbors on East and the West. They fully well know that they're not dealing with any nincompoop. They are dealing with a person who is steeped in spiritual depth and substance. And therefore... He again is a man of tremendous steel and a person who will who gives no nonsense to anyone and will not take any nonsense from anyone. He is a person who is not scared. He's not because he says, I saw his interview and he said, stress is one thing I have never encountered in my life. A person who has his roots in the unseen hands of the Almighty will not have no stress whatsoever. He has been a hermit before he joined politics. That is his strength. And that is why the SQ comes. Montgomery, in his pathways of leadership, has says the army may be so powerful and a person may be powerful, but ultimately the victory belongs to the one who is spiritually strong and has spiritual depth. And this spiritual depth gives a person. Leaders come and leaders go, but leaders with spiritual quotient are the ones who are the longest lasting leaders. Tough times do not last. 
tough people like Mr. Narendra Modi do, sir. And this is where we see that many Narendra Modis are coming up. I see Corona warriors. He coined the term Corona warriors in his first address, you may recall. And I salute every Safai Karmi, every constable, every person in the medical and health department, every doctor. The doctors have paid the supreme sacrifice. 555 doctors have given the supreme sacrifice. A thousand plus policemen have given the sacrifice in Maharashtra alone and not to count the so many people. Constable who does not have deep pockets. I know of hundreds of constables. It is because of the inspiration from the topmost level. A constable, a person of very modest wound, would first feed five people and then eat himself. Can any of us even think of doing that? Feeding five and then eating oneself. And the same food, not something that is substandard. What food that constable will eat, he'll first feed five. And it's not the question of one constable. I salute these constables because I cannot be the dust of their feet. These constables are my heroes. Naren Modi is a hero. And Naren Modi is instrumental in converting these constables and these into heroes. And like you, I have no political ambition and therefore also. But I have the moral strength to respect courage, patriotism and character when, when it, it, it's there. Very fascinating, fantastic. I have had an opportunity of meeting Honorable Prime Minister at Savadi Modi in Bangkok last year when we handled that show. It was really an impressive looking at such a great man. And I want to tell the audience, yes, when I get up in the morning, when I pray to God, I do pray for Narendra Modi's long life to, be, to deal with this great world with a lot of challenges around. Very fascinating, and I think you gave a very right, and you said that in case we talk about authentic leadership and we don't talk about the man, then it's not right. Not right. I love that statement, sir. That's a very powerful statement. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussion is getting so wonderful that it's an unending process of looking at such a great man who is sharing his thought process on the leadership excellence. I have had many programs and I think even last uh, uh, week I had uh, Lieutenant General A.K. Singh. We had a wonderful chat last time also. And I think it's getting more and more exciting. Now I have another important question coming, uh, Dr. Singh. And this is now leadership in crisis. And when we talk about one side, authentic leadership, and one side we talk about leadership in crisis. And I am going especially here to another part of this question, that while during pandemic, things were going bad, there were some women leaders in the world who were very different. Some of the prime ministers who were holding the positions as women leaders with that compassion. Why was, is there a difference when there's a crisis? I mean, I understand when there was a crisis, my mom could take control of it. And I always say, my mother is the best quality of the world. I remember my Amaji and she must be watching me. She is the best quality of the world. Is there a difference when we talk about leadership in crisis? Do you think, do you believe that women can handle crisis much stronger than the men? What is your view on this? Any day. It's a matter of recognition and it's a matter on record. Our ancient rishis mentioned in the Durga Shabda, 700 stanzas on the praise of womanhood. Sarva Bhuta Yada Devi Swarga Mukti Pradayani. It is the women who provide you liberation, liberty and everything that is precious on earth and it is in heaven. They did not say about you and me. They did not say about the menfolk. They only Sarva Bhuta Yada Devi Swarga Mukti Pradayani. But we did a disservice to ourselves when we did not harness this woman power because wherever women are today, they are not better than men folk. They are generations ahead of men folk, whether it is the armed forces, the police, whether it's the corporate world, whether it is politics, their integrity, their compassion, their spiritual quotient, everything. I can assure you, I'm now in the education world. I used to be in the police. You give a task to a man, you give a task to a woman you will find that the woman outshines the man. I mean, there is no comparison. There, comparison should be between comparables. My university, I'll give you my example. We respect only merit. There is no reservation. 
But today we have more than 70% of the faculty are ladies and more than 60% of the students are girls. By this token, in five years, I tell the boys, boys, this will be an all girls and all women university in five years. If you don't pull up your socks and don't improve your performance. Look where the girls have going. Look at their publications. Look at their PhD quality. Look at their accolades and the gold medals. Almost 90% of the gold medals and the medals are won by girls. That is a proof of the saying that women, if given the opportunity, will outshine the boys and the men any day, any time, in any arena. Wow, that's fascinating. And I, I am certainly a believer of it. And in my life, I would like to say that there have been very great women. And I talk about Dr. Kiran Bedi. I talk about my mom. I talk about many colleagues. I talked about Dr. Anu Singh Latter. She is the Vice Chancellor of Ambedkar University. I talk about my sisters. They have been more powerful. I talk about my wife. Unfortunately, I don't have a daughter. But then there are women who have worked with me as peers, as uh, you know, uh, leaders, and those who are working in my company, be it in Bangkok or uh, Thailand, is full of women. And of course, even in India, no, no, this is again women led. And having said that, when this we are talking about compassion, we are talking about that credibility, the courage, the crisis. Uh, and we are talking about people like uh, Asha Bandarkars, who has been part of my life. I created this women power, hashtag women power, a global movement around the world with a mission. 100,000 women on this platform by 2021 and 1 million by 2024, irrespective of color, caste, caste. creed, nationality and religion. And number one women power is Dr. Kiran Bedi, second is Sister Shivani, and then there are people around the world in 20 countries. Sir, I am also passionate about it. And I am posing a question to you today. When we will take this, we are right now taking on a virtual platform. I am every Saturday with the women power of excellence on this show, every Saturday at 5.30 whether Shazia Almi, whether Shibani Kashyap, whether CEO of Noida, Ritu Maheshwari, she does great job, mm -hmm. whether my excellency, our excellency, ambassador of Thailand, Suchitra Durai, madam, many IPS, IS officers. I want to take some uh, time from you. When I am creating this movement around the world, would you support this women power, a global movement? And give us your time someday to support this moment to take it forward. God bless you. I'm overwhelmed once again, Mr. Bakshi. May God always bless your path. This is one task that will prove that DK Bakshi is not an ordinary entrepreneur, not an ordinary guru. He is a karm yogi to the core. What was left unattended by many, DK Bakshi has taken it up. And it will be my proud privilege to assist you in how small a manner I can but I'm always at your disposal for this pious cause, for this holy cause. So nice of you, sir. We will soon be coming to your international university in Noida. Uh, Sonal Verma, uh, the Indian chapter head of Human Power must be listening. We need to go and meet uh, director. Uh, we'll meet with the chancellor of international university, Dr. Vikram Singh, and take this women power forward, at least in NCR, whatever support. My another question, you have been delivering so many keynote speeches, talks in all domains of business, education, police, community. What are your one or two or three messages to the business leaders or education leaders or community leaders or political leaders? What kind of new DNA of leadership they should adapt and adopt? My one-liners would be very clear and unambiguous. Please be the instrument and face the change. Things are moving so fast that one really has to run just to stay still. And then please understand that yesterday profits were earned through expediency. Today profits are earned with through integrity. Yesterday value was extra. Today value is everything. Wow. Please ask yourself, 
at the end of the day, CRS is not adequate. CRS is just pigeon feed. CRS, no. In what way has your organization been able to serve your country? In what way has the organization, your business been able to serve society? And if the answer to both the questions is yes, you are on the right track. But if it has only been able to serve you and your family, well, the animal kingdom also does the same. There has to be a marked difference between the animal kingdom and us. And that is that look for the country, look for the society and integrity and value. They have to be of prime concern. What else could I expect from a personality like you? Padmashri, Dr. Pritam Singh, who has been my guru, and we lost him during COVID days, end of June. And a few days back, he was on my webinar, and he said, leaders who work for others do not die. And leaders who work for themselves do die. Hey, Padmashri, Pritam Singh, you're watching us. And that's a fact of life. And a similar kind of thoughts you could give us today that this is my message to leaders. Sir, my last question. You have been very accomplished police general, decorated police officer, beauty of being in every sphere of roles and responsibilities, accountabilities, best awards, best accolades. Now even the chancellor of such a great university, what, what, what is your mission now? And what motivates you? What is your purpose of life now, sir? Very good question. And I would say that at the end of the day, in the twilight years, it, everybody's motto, it should be the motto, to give back to society as a lucky person, extremely fortunate person I got from my parents, from my respected teachers, from this great country and society to give back to them. And if there are any fault lines which I would like to address is the neurotic pursuit of consumerism, the blind following of crime, hedonism and violence, and to be away from an ostentatious and a flashy lifestyles. And the new idols of our youth who have become clowns and braggarts to remove and bring them real-time heroes, Narendra Modi, Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Badshah Khan and the like. They deserve to be our heroes and icons and not the clowns and the braggarts. Ostentatious living destroys the germ of all future seeds of greatness. As I was told by my teachers and by my parents, if you really want to be great, reduce your office and your home into a hermitage. Live like a hermit. You don't earn for yourself. Get the basic for yourself and your family. The rest has to be given to the society. And unless you give back to the society, I don't think you have done. You will not have the satisfaction of a life nobly lived and a duty well done. And if that be the case, my job is to, I, at my age, it, I, it, it is, can be very demanding to lecture four times a day. But I do that because it is a part of my duty. God has been kind. Society has been kind. My motherland has been so kind to me. So the least I can do in whatever small way I can to tell what pays and what does not pay. The mistakes that some people may have made, I may have made, I would not like the younger generation to make the, and repeat the same mistakes. I would like to tell them that the only shortcut to success is integrity, honesty, and a sterling, unimpeachable character. Wow. Oh my God. Fascinating, sir. You are a guru. You are a mentor. Please treat me as your mentee. I am in Noida. I will come and meet you personally. Now, social distancing is almost over. Hopefully, yes. January, we should be there. I would like to touch your feet. And because you are a guru, you are a mentor. Sir, I have a lot of questions coming from various quarters. Let me take some of the questions. And I am taking the first question from Facebook. And there's a question, Dr. Vikram Singh. I have watched the debates that you have participated and admire you for your candid, unbiased views and true patriot. Wish our police follow you, police force follow your inspirational leadership and protect the interests of the people and the country. Oh, this is an observation. His name is Chandrasekhar Ramaswamy. Mr. Chandrasekhar Ramaswamy, this is, you have certainly appreciated the guru, the 
I can't say the dawn. I can say the dawn. Dawn is a positive word today. Dawn of a police force. And that is a compliment. Yes, sir. Let me see the question. Oh, now he is a question. Uh, same person is asking a question. Chandrasekhar Ramaswamy. What is your view on the current functioning of police force on crime, law and order, and advice to them to make our country safe for people? There are That's multiple the fault lines. There are multiple fault lines, sir. And the first would be the cause that integrity is non-negotiable. There should be, I would expect the police leadership as they have a saying, that there are no bad soldiers, there are only bad generals. Integrity wow. should be ensured at the topmost level. As I said before, that one has to be a hermit inside and outside both. It cannot be that I post to be a hermit because a police force is one. The number of junior colleagues would know exactly where I take my bribe from and where I park my illegitimate funds. Therefore, the signal that is very negative would be first ensure unimpeachable integrity. Then take pains to go a step forward and ensure a people-friendly policing. Today, you don't even have haunted police stations because even ghosts would not like to visit a police station because of the scare and the general reputation of a police station and the policeman. I have to be a people-friendly, people-friendly laws and do what is expected of the police to do. Register the cases, investigate them fairly and honestly and charge sheet the bad characters and help and protect the, those who abide by the rule of law. This is very simple. It's not rocket science. And this needs to be perfectly doable at zero budget. There's one more question coming from Aparna Sen. She is from Global Talent Television. She's watching. And she says, Sir, we do a lot of training programs for police force. They are being given a lot of trainings. Even then, they are involved, involved in corruption and crime. How can we avoid that? Aparna, there's one small sentence that I inherited from my guru, Mr. B. You have to be cruel to be kind. Those who are corrupt, those who are inefficient, those who indulge in anti-people activity will have to be dismissed from service. That is why the police has a feudal system of dismissal without batting an eyelid, which no other organization has. If 100 people join the police today, it is expected that 30 would lose their jobs because the expectation of society and the department are so high and lofty that everybody will not be able to come up to their expectation. Therefore, 30% dismissals. Today, everybody has become so goody-goody that punishment does not happen. Dismissals do not happen at all. Even to the extent that if there's a Hathras case or any such case where you're supposed to take punitive action, we do, I really don't know. We police officers or ex-police officers are not supposed to be a part of any popularity context. You're not in any popularity context. You're supposed to perform a job if it is not up to the norms, just throw him out. Otherwise, people will throw you out of the memory files. And there may be a time when this populism will eat into the very system of policing and will bring a bad day where more people like Aparna what has gone wrong with the police in spite of the training and investment? What has gone wrong? What has gone wrong is, again, blame the leadership. If the if the son is a delinquent, my father always said, if the, you are delinquent, I wouldn't blame you. I'll blame me because I was responsible for your being a delinquent. Oh, my God. Fantastic. Uh, every, every word you speak is a learning. Every word you speak is a leadership lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, understand this lesson. I'm going to watch it again and again. There's one more question coming from. This is Jyotsina Fodeda, she is saying, people like you who have done so much for the country as a police officer, when we have issues of terrorism, are you being consulted for taking action at this point of time or not by the authorities? Jyotsina, it has been my proud privilege to give my advice, not only to police officers, but also to police leadership not only in Uttar Pradesh, but right across, but also to the political leadership as well. My debates, as I've been told by my politician friends, that immediately after the debate, the points that I raise, the point that I suggest, they make a note of it and pass it on to the senior most political boss in the state. And they are taken into account, the cognizance is taken, but very often my suggestions are bitter and perhaps not good for electoral results. So that is for them to decide 
what is good for electoral results may not be so good for good governance. It is for them to make a choice. But yes, they are gracious enough to ask for my advice once in a while. And whatever I can do in my own small way, that is available to them absolutely free, of course, 24 by 7.